most people thought then and still today think that cancer is generally caused by maybe chemical carcinogens, those chemicals in the environment, in the water, in the food, and that we get cancer from that source and we worry about it, those small amounts of chemicals that we may get exposed to. And sure enough, some of them can, in fact, sort of initiate cancer. That's not the issue. But in any case, that's one way that we tend to think about the causes of cancer. The other way, to some extent, we know of certain viruses that might lead to cancer. Things like hepatitis B virus or papillomavirus. Maybe you've heard about these causing particular kinds of cancers. So there's a couple of kinds of causes of cancer. Thirdly, we tend to think that genes cause cancer. What that really means in a practical sense is that cancer runs in certain families. And we have a genetic predisposition, some of us, if you will, for getting cancer. Those are the three big ticket kind of ideas that most people talked about in science and to some extent in the public about what causes cancer. What we were seeing here, and this, I, I want to go through this because what we were seeing here was really substantially different. What I was seeing, I thought, was the idea that simply nutrition, the stuff that we regard as important to our health, when done in the wrong way, that could cause cancer. So that was an exciting proposition. So you have a first principle, nutrition could turn on and turn off cancer. You might wonder where I'm going with this. But at the end of the presentation, I want to, I'm going to end up with about eight principles. And it's going to sort of like be the pillar post of how we tend to think about science and how that in turn tends to think and shape our way of thinking about nutrition and health. In any case, here's the second one. Uh, this is a little schematic. This is a schematic uh, simply to illustrate, let's say in this particular case, how genes become involved in causing cancer formation. What I'm showing here, and this is just a schematic, in this particular case here, we've got some normal cells, let's say. On the one hand, if we, let's say, mutate some of these cells to create more cancer genes, as you can see here with the red sort of little cells, over here we'll take what we'll do for comparison, another sort of uh, experiment where we create less cancer genes. So we got two sort of situations here. One situation with a lot of cancer genes, the other with much less. Now, from that point onwards in theory, and to some extent in practice, if the nutrition stays the same, obviously the animal starting out, or the people, if, we, if those of us who have more cancer genes, and we do the same kind, let's say in theory, we do the same kind of nutrition, we get more tumors. That is fair enough to say the genes cause cancer. More cancer over here, less over here. So genes cause cancer. That's a popular idea. We think genes cause cancer. I must tell you, everything actually, whether it's cancer or other diseases, or good things, good health, everything starts from a genetic basis. That's the first step. So we get all kinds of genes to do all kinds of things, good things, bad things, if you will. So genes are the starting place, and it's reasonable to assume, therefore, they are a cause. However, look at this. When this particular kind of scheme, and this is what we basically did, uh, in any case here, in this particular case here, these animals are destined to get more tumors, these over here are less, but in fact, if these in this particular case here are given low protein, they get the less. So in other words, whereas we may have assumed that genes are so important and how much you know, altered genes we may have in the beginning, what really matters is what we subsequently do with those genes. And so nutrition controls how genes behave. Very important principle. A very important principle has major implications for thinking about all kinds of things. So principle number two, nutrition controls genes, which in turn control cancer. In addition, then we I began to ask the question, I didn't pay a lot of attention to this in the beginning, we started to ask the question, what about this protein that actually is controlling cancer growth? What is this protein we're using? Well, it turns out we were just simply using the protein that was available in the marketplace at the time that researchers tend to use. 
one readily available. It actually turns out to be cow's milk protein. So um, that's basically casein, representing 87% approximately of total protein in cow's milk. That's what was turning on, in fact, the cancer. So he said, OK, what happens if we try a couple of plant proteins in this model? It turned out we tried soy protein and wheat protein. Even when fed at the high levels, the 20% of total, incidentally, that 20% of protein in the diet was the amount more or less recommended. This is going to come back to be equivalent to what we do as humans, too, but for, 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 for the moment. But in any case, soy protein, wheat protein, even when fed at the higher levels, did not, in fact, uh, turn on that cancer. So here was a, all of a sudden an idea that was beginning to rise. Not enough information, I can assure you, but it's certainly quite provocative in the, in the different ways that these kinds of proteins behaved. So we had a principle here, in my view, namely that nutrients of animal-based foods function differently from nutrients in plant-based foods. Now, that's a big statement there to make with so little information. That information was provocative, yes, but in order to get really to that principle, we'd have to do a lot more, and we did do a lot more. We looked at things like pancreatic cancer, mammary cancer, in different kinds of ways. We looked at other kinds of nutrients, not just protein. So that statement there is based not on what I just showed you. It's actually based on comparing nutrients from plants and nutrients from animal foods and having a look to see what they did with respect to cancer, which in turn leads us to that principle. Incidentally, one of the, I, one of the reasons I like to talk about principles, that gets around that really gets around the question concerning whether or not you're doing experiments in the laboratory with experimental animals, which I don't really support anymore, but that's the way we all did it. It gets around the question concerning whether or not that information in the experimental animal situation is applicable to humans. Because when we discover principle, I'm talking about a principle of biology, a principle of mammalian biology in particular that applies to regardless of, let's say, age or gender or species, if you will. That's what I mean by principle, something really, really fundamental you know, for our thinking. Okay. So anyhow, this is principle number three, nutrients of animal-based foods, you know, many done different ways, actually behave differently from plant-based foods. That was one of the first inklings I really started to get. There's something here with respect to our revered animal foods on the one hand and possibly you know, plant foods on the other. So as a sidebar, I don't count this as an altogether new principle, but it's another way of interpreting this. And this was really provocative. And that was the idea that casein itself is the most relevant chemical car carcinogen ever tested. If you, th you know, <laughs> recognize that, I mean, that was about as provocative as I, I can assure you that one could ever imagine. The most revered of all nutrients, animal-based protein, if you will, if I can say that, causing the most, uh, most serious of all diseases, cancer. I mean, we're just having really a clashing of, of ideas here. I took that idea, actually. We did that research in different ways. I took it to the three major laboratories in the world, two in the United States, one with the United Nations and made the presentation to those who are doing this kind of research on chemical carcinogens and made my presentation to them because I wanted to get the critique for those who would most likely disagree. I really didn't get disagreement. It was so provocative, I was told, you'll never tell that. In one case, when I was in North Carolina talking to a National Institutes of Health uh, research group, uh, they concluded, yes, you're doing the right thing. This looks good. But you're not going to do. You're going to have to go to the White House before you ever sell that idea. That was along about 1982-83. Uh, so I knew we were onto something here that was kind of buried in the backgrounds or recesses of our mind. The idea that casein is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified, but it is. Mm -hmm.